שלום שלום חברים, אני שמח מאוד להוראות, החברים שלי, uh, it is good to be able to see my friends and I want to talk to you just a, just a very brief moment here about some, um, uh, some of the things here in Genesis. Uh, also, uh, I might add to you, before I get started here with Genesis here a little bit, just some interesting insights I want to share with you that's something that perhaps we've overlooked ourselves and I think would be a blessing for you. Um, the book Yom Suf, uh, Hasefer Yom Suf, um, is ready to come out. We finally got the, the, the final version from our publisher. And I'm just real quick looking over that, over the Hebrew uh, parts that are in the book because there are some corrections that need to be made. shouldn't take just a couple of days here. And then we can get the book actually out to the printers. And uh, we'll be printing uh, those books there. I don't know how long it'll be before it's available on Amazon and Books A Million, but I do know that it will be available there. Uh, mainly online is where you'll find that. As we are able to get a publicist uh, lined up, we'll be able to do a little bit more with that, getting actual books on the store shelves. And as uh, more people are interested in, in, in discussing the content of the book, Yom Suf, uh, we did, though, go over budget on this. And uh, we, we, we know there's been quite a few of you that have been so kind to uh, help us out on this and getting the book out. And we will be sending each one of you a copy of the book as well. And uh, for those of you, though, that, that might still be able to help us out a little bit more to cover the cost, um, we're actually, I hate to say it, but we're probably about $600 uh, short in getting that covered. Uh, we're also, though, as I said, though, we want to try to get a publicist involved in this as well. Uh, we have a, a good publicist out of New York. Uh, it, it is a little expensive to do that. Uh, we're talking about $1,500, $2,000 to do something like that. Uh, if the Lord lays anything on your heart and you'd like to contribute towards that as well, we would be greatly appreciated. The only reason we're looking to do a publicist is because we need to do everything we can to be able to get the book out in the public hands for both Christians, for both uh, the Jewish people, which is my biggest goal is to reach my Jewish brethren. The book is incredibly strong in dealing with the identity of the Messiah, looking at the insights that Moses has written that have never before been revealed uh, by God's grace. He's been kind enough to allow me to see a lot of these things, and I think it will really shake the Jewish community uh, into to considering who Moshiach ben David actually is. So I, I, we certainly ask you to prayerfully consider what you would be able to do to help us in that, and we greatly thank each and every one of you. I try to always uh, send letters to those that contribute, and I apologize that we didn't get the book out sooner. We were hoping to have it out before the holiday, but that didn't happen. So my apologies for that. And as soon as we get the books in, we will actually be mailing them all to you as quickly as we can. God bless you richly for that. Uh, let's look again. Let's look, excuse me. Let's, let's go to the uh, book of Genesis here. Bereshit uh, is the Hebrew translation for that word, Genesis. It actually means at the first. Um, I'm going to read to you a little bit. I'm going to read in Hebrew, Hebrew as well as I'll read in English. I'm not going to do everything in Hebrew, but I'll do some. Uh, but let's just quickly look at the very beginning. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz ve'ha'aretz hayata tohu ve'vohu ve'choshik al p'nei tohum ve'ruach Elohim malchafet al p'nei ha'mayim. It literally says here, in the beginning, or at the first, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, there is a semicolon here. It's kind of like a, we'd say like a period, maybe you might put in here. God never said how long it took him to create the heavens and the earth. He just simply said, Barashit bara Elohim et Okay, the heavens and the earth. Now, it's interesting, though, to note, and this is what I want to bring you into. It's very interesting. Shemaim, the heavens. Sometimes we don't realize what Shemaim really is. It is a word that we're going to look at here in just a minute that God gives, he calls uh, a firmament or a, it's kind of like a boundary line between two places and he calls it Shemaim. And it's not the atmosphere just around the earth that we're looking at when God says this. This includes the stars, the moon, the sun, 
Larot, as we would say in Hebrew, the, the, the lights uh, that, that, were, that God made. He made uh, Larot Gadola uh, and Katan, a great light and a small light, which we typically represent as the sun and the moon. But anyway, let me take you uh, into this a little bit more. As we see here, God says here in the beginning, he, he created the heavens and the earth. Okay, and then he also goes on to say, when the earth was astonishingly empty and, with, and there was darkness upon the surface of the deep. Interesting thought there, and I'm not going to really go into that, but he says there was darkness upon the deep and the divine presence or the Spirit of God. See, Tahum Vehuach Elohim Machafet Alpanechamayim And the Spirit of God brooded, we would say, or, or kind of hovered over uh, this, this, uh, the waters here. Ve'yomer Elohim yahi or ve'yahi or and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Ve'yore Elohim et ha'or kitov and God saw that the light was good. Ve'yavdel um, Elohim ben and God separated between uh, ha'or uvein ha'choshek, he separated between the light and the darkness. Now, when you first read Genesis, you might look at this, and, and, we, and we look at this in a natural thinking. But as I begin to get deeper into Genesis, and, and honestly, my brother, sister, uh, um, ach, uh, I really have been amazed at what God says in here. Let's look at verse 6. This is what really got me right here. God says here, Okay, and God said, Let there be a firmament. Rakia betocha maim veyehi mavdil ben maim. Okay? He said, let there be a ferment between the waters, plural, waters, and separate, see, ma vedil, ma vedil, ben, and separate between the water, la maim, from the water, or to the water. So God puts a firmament between the waters. Now, it's, it may sound kind of odd here, but I want you to follow me here. Ya'as Elohim et ha'rakia. See? And God made et ha'rakia, a firmament. Ve'yavdil ben ha'mayim asha mitachat. See? And God made a firmament between, see, he separated between the waters. Um, I'm sitting here translating it as I'm reading it, not, let me, let me give you a little bit more accurate translation as we're going here. So God made the firmament and separated between the waters which were beneath the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament. Asher, yes, mitachat, okay, above and, okay, li-rakia uven hamayim asha me'al uh, and it was so and he made that he made that makes that firmament now here's what's interesting he's separating between the waters and when he makes that separation between the waters and it was so he says they and God called Elohim they Elohim Larakia the firmament he's calling this firmament Shemaim so it's the second day he puts this this uh, this vast separation between the two. And now, this is where we kind of get in our mind because we find out that God puts in that firmament, He puts the stars, He puts the, the moon, the sun, and all of these things. And so therefore, because we read this in a, in a literal form and not possibly as a metaphoric term, or maybe a deeper spiritual meaning, we automatically think that in that second day, God takes, because Yom Shine, God has actually created the heavens, and this is where God is going to put the stars at and stuff like that, so it's the second day that God created the stars and stuff. But that 
necessarily is not so. It seems to imply to me that we have a dimensional situation here. Now, it's funny because even scientists are beginning to notice, like they look at these holes that they see, these, these, uh, these I forget what they call them in the universe, these, these uh, dark black holes or whatever it is, and they believe it's an avenue to go to another side. But my question is here, is why has God separated between the waters and he's put a firmament between it? Where is that other water? And yet scientists will tell you, if you can find a planet with water on it, it's got life. And I would agree with that. Because water represents life. Did not God say, I'll give you living water? We have that both in the Tanakh as well as the Christian Bible has it in there when Jesus tells a woman at the well, you know, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for a drink, I'd give you living waters that you don't have to come here and thirst. That's what divides it. The firmament, all the heavens, all the universe, everything you can see out there separates between the water that's on earth that is giving you a natural life here and the water of God that is in another dimension elsewhere. It is life itself. There's a separation in there. And I have just been blown away by this. Let me just look here again here. I, I, I want to share with you some more. Because uh, when we go into verse 9, this is when we begin to realize, okay, now God is actually talking about what's happening on earth. Ve'yomer Elohim ikavav hamayim mitachad hashemayim, okay, and he's taking the water that is under the, under the, under the heavens, el hamakum echad, he gathers them to one place, el makum, makum means place, echad is one, in, to one place, ve'tere uh, ve'yabasha, uh, he can, okay? He gathers the waters into one place and he let the dry land appear. All right, now, so he gets into that and what's interesting, then we go on into the part where, as, as you're reading on down here, after he does that, he says, God called the dry land, he calls it earth, to the gathering of the waters he called seas. But this has nothing to do with the water that's on the other side of that heaven. And that's something I want you to see. But, but it's going to get better than that. God goes on to talk about in, in verses 10 and 11 uh, and, and, and uh, let's see the earth and, and the gathering of the waters he called seas and God was, uh, saw that it was good so God uh, said let the earth sprout vegetation herbage yielding seed fruit trees yielding fruit each, each after its kind containing its, its own seed on the earth and it was so and the earth brought forth vegetation we know all this here okay let's jump on down let's go, let's go into verse 14 all right Ve'yomer Elohim, ihaye mohot birkea hashemayim lahavdil ben. All right, now he said, and God says, um, let there be lights, or luminaries, we might say, lights, uh, that would be in the firmament, and it would, uh, of the heavens, and, and we, it would separate between Turn the page so I can read the rest of this here. Hayom uven halayala vehayu lech leotat leotot. And the day and the night. It separates between the days and the nights and everything. Uh, and this is what gives you the signs. This is what gives you your festivals, your days and your years as God goes on to say about this. He's talking about what he does in the heavens, as we know, we know that the whole universe, the stars, everything, uh, is something that God put up there. I mean, he says right here, they shall serve as signs and for festivals and for days and for years, and they shall serve uh, as luminaries in the firmament of the heaven to shine upon the earth. And it was so, and God made the two luminaries, the greater luminary to dominate the day and the lesser light to dominate the night. Uh, this, and the stars, and he, so he throws in there and he created the stars as well. And God set them in, in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth to dominate the day and, and by night and to separate between the light of the darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening, there was morning, that's the fourth day. Now, what's interesting to me though, when God starts speaking about 
uh, back over here on the page before we got into this, he speaks about all the vegetation and stuff that's coming on the earth. But what's interesting, though, we don't see anything about the tree of life at that point. We don't see anything about the tree of knowledge of good and evil at that point. And I'm saying this because we're starting to look at a, at least what I can see, it's, it's, it's a dimensional uh, it's a dimensional thing that God is dealing with right here. I mean, when God separates the water from the waters and he puts a firmament in there, I want to know where that other water is. I mean, when you begin to think about it, everything that God has done is a type of what he did over here. When he split the rock in the wilderness and the water came forth out of that rock, there was a separation in between there. And water flowed from the rock. When Christ was, when Jesus himself of Nazareth come and he died, his body was split. When Adam, when God wanted to create and make Eve from Adam, she, God split Adam. He took half of him and opened him up and brought forth his wife. Everywhere we see, even in the creation, God has a parting. And, and then water, always water represents life. So it's just fascinating to me. Okay, let's, let's just look at this here too. Vayomer Elohim Nelse Adom Beslamenu Kidamodotenu Ve Yerodo. Oh, this one's really good. Oh my gosh. And God said, let us make a man in our, in our own, in our image, after our likeness. Now, this is what's good here. They are a do, and they shall rule. You know, it was fascinating, though. Actually, the they are a do, it actually comes, basically the root of this word is, is yored. And it's to come down, actually. Even though it means to rule or have dominion over. But they're able to come down. Where are they coming down from? I mean, it's... I believe it's because they're coming out of God. God is creating them. They're, they're part of Him. And now He's going to make them and, and bring them in a way where they can come down and take control of God's creation. And it's also fascinating to me because He says, There are a do bidagot, bidagot, excuse me, hayom, bidagot hayom. They're going to rule over the fish in the sea. Now you tell me how Adam and Eve are going to have dominion or rule or to come down and to be over the fish in the sea. We are looking, and also, and he doesn't say just the fish there, he says right after that, Ube of Hashemayim, and the birds of the, of the air. You know, to, to, to be able to rule, to have dominion, they come down and they're able to you know, if Adam could name all the animals, and here now God is making it to where they actually have rulership over them, what kind of abilities did they have? I mean, you're talking about, could they actually go into the depths of the sea? Undoubtedly so. I mean, how are you going to have a dominion over something if God doesn't give you the access to go there, to be have the domain over it? So... We're thinking in our finite minds trying to figure this out when it's, it's so much deeper and so incredibly beautiful here. I, I, I just love it. And he gives, them, he gives them the dominion over the whole earth, over all the animals, over every creeping thing of the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female created he them. And this is where Eve is and Adam are actually one. You know, I've... I've there's, there, it has been suggested that the word Adam itself, we know Adam comes from Adama, and we could also say that as far as like in mankind or humankind, when we look at the name Adam, because Adam is only a reflection of the, of, of the body that God has created from the dust of the earth. And I say that because you have to keep in mind, God says here, he cre you know, in the image of God created he, him, male and female, he created them. Okay, so let me just catch it in the Hebrew for you. Beslemo, Beslam, Elohim, Barah, Oto, God created him, 
Zachar unakeba, male and female, bara otam. He created them. See, they were one inside of one body, both Adam and Eve, the spirit of them dwelled in that one body. Now, I've gone over this with you before, so, but, so I'll, I'll try not to stay too long on this. And I don't want this to be too long of a video either. I want to kind of get to some highlights for you. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and every living thing that moves on the earth. Wow. For your adult, be dagat, hayom, to rule over the fish. See, he's giving both of them rulership. They're co-equal in what they're doing, ruling everything. I can only, could you only imagine what that must have been like when they were here? Uh, it, it just, it's beyond me to understand. So, anyway, though, let's let's jump forward a little bit here. I want I want to really get into a little something else here. Now. I'm jumping into chapter two now because I want to just touch on some of the highlights here because this is really, it's fascinating to me when I look at this because we're not dealing, I mean, there's such a spiritual matter here that, that's beyond comprehension. Let's just kind of begin up here, verse one, thus the heaven and the earth were finished in all their array. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he abstained on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because on it he abstained from all of his work which God created to make. These are the products, okay? Ele taladot. And actually, it's, it's the same word as far as like giving birth to. When we say uh, uh, if a woman gives birth, she brings forth uh, a child, uh, teled. Uh, and so in here we say ele taladot hashemayim. These are the products, or these are, how does the King James translate that? Let me just look at that for the Christian friends that are watching this here. Um, and God bless the seventh day. Okay, so these are the generations of the heavens. Hmm. Well, generations, I don't think would be a good translation on that at all. It's, it's um, I don't know. That, anyway, we won't get hooked up on that. Uh, so he says, Ele taladot. Hashemayim v'chaz, b'chabara, b'orom, b'yom osot. Now, I want to kind of go slowly here with you here. All right, this is, this is what God has created on the earth when they were created on the day that uh, Hashem, God, made the earth in the heaven. Yehaveh Elohim Eretz Hashemayim. Now, so we have here, now all the trees of the field were not yet on the earth, and the herb of the field had not yet sprouted. For Hashem God had not sent rain upon the earth. There was no man to work the soil. Now that's an interesting point. God intended, though, for Adam to work. The curse that man, if we find out after the fall, that uh, he would, thorns and thistles of ground would yield for him. It never meant that God did not intend for Adam to work, because he did intend for him to work. Uh, because he does say that there. Now, this is what I want to bring out. Okay. Yahweh Elohim Eretz. Okay. Behashemayim. Veko Shayach Chadesha Terem. Okay. Not yet. Terem means not yet. Yahia Ba'aretz Vekol Osav Hadesh. Excuse me. Hasade Hasade Terem Yotzmach. Yes, excuse me. So nothing had, had started to grow on the earth. This is what, what we're looking at here. That's what, I'm really pondering some of these things here as far as a dimensional, even on the earth, maybe in a, in a, in a, in a dimensional world there because the earth itself, there, the seeds were there, but there was nothing growing on it. Okay, we're going to find out that what grows is actually in the garden is where it starts at. Now, See, because God said he had, not brought, he had not sent the rain upon the earth and there was no man to work the soil. Okay? Um, okay, yes, and he had not sent the man to, to work the ground. Okay. Okay. Uh, the dirt, um, 
oh gosh, I'm not translating, I'm sorry, I apologize for that. And, and Hashem God formed the man of the dust of the ground. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. There was no, yes, I want to get into the creation. Let's look real quick at the creation. We've gone through this before. Let's real quick go back to it again. Et hadam afar min hadama. He forms the man from the dust of the earth. Okay, here's where it's very important that you get this right here. Okay, we're going to get into something very beautiful right here. They pach be apav, apav, excuse me, nishmat. Now the word nishmat, nishmat chayim ve'yehi ha'adam, let me just read the whole thing, nishmat chayim ve'yehi ha'adam enefesh chaya. Now, in the King James Bible here, that is used here, let me just compare real quick where this verse is, it should be verse 7, I believe, in chapter 2. You have here, and the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Uh, I say that to you because let me tell you, this is what's incredible here. Keep in mind, we talked about that water separating the firmament. God put the heavens, all the stars, everything. It's not just the atmosphere around the earth. It's all the stars, everything. There's firmament between the water that's on the earth and a water that is another place there. So keep that in mind. I know it's a little awkward to throw this in here on you, but let's just keep that in mind. So it says, Nishmat Chaim. Now, Chaim literally is a plural form for the word life. Okay? I say that to you because when God speaks about the tree of life that is in the Garden of Eden, it's in the midst of the garden. It doesn't say it's planted anywhere. The word Chaim comes from, literally comes from the life of God, but it's in a plural form. And in Hebrew, when it says the tree of life, it says Eitz Chaim. Now, we don't see anything about the partaking of Eitz Chaim, but God does tell Adam that if you take from Eitz, Eitz, Ladat Ve'ra'ah, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Motamot, uh, you shall surely die. So we're sitting here looking here. I'm, I'm looking at this here, and I see that God says, Nishmar Chaim ve'yehi ha'adam. Okay? And he, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Or he breathed into him. And, you know, do you realize the word Nishmat? Actually, it's interesting with this word right here. It actually comes from the word soul. He breathes, he breathes like a soul of God's own life inside of him. Totally different from the animals itself. The animals have uh, nefesh chaya. In other words, the only reason they can live is because of the life of God. Chai, we say in Hebrew, chai is, chai means life. But it's literally taken from God's life because the divine letter yod in there is from the divine name Hashem as we would say, or Yahweh, or Jehovah, as some people say in English. Um, but as we hear, see here, it's Nishmar Chaim, Hadam Lenefesh, for his soul, Haya is the light of God. Literally, Yah being God. God's own light was in him, you know, but it's in a plural form. And what's fascinating is the tree of life, it's Chaim. You know, that tree is in the midst of the garden. I believe that this is maybe in a metaphoric term. It's God himself dwelling in that garden. Because, you know, even when God drives them out of the garden, he says, you know, he put the, the guards around, the angels around there to guard the, guard the way back to the tree of life. Because why? If they take from the tree of life, they would live forever. God freely gave it to him. And when he forms Eve, when he forms his wife, and he takes and opens up Adam and forms a, a wife beside him, a help me, as we say, corresponding to him, she's not a lesser creation. She's perfectly equal with him. And God takes and he forms Eve, no mention of God having to breathe into her nostrils the breath of life. Why? Because God had put a plural form of that life in Adam, and when he separated that, he was able to put the he was able to separate masculine and feminine. 
Why? Because he was already in Adam to begin with. He created them, male and female, created he them, Zaha, Nakeva, Unakeva, Otam. He created male and female them. So when he breathed that breath of life into his nostrils, he breathed that spirit of Almighty God into both of them. No wonder why it's a plural form of life. Because there was more than one in that body called Adam. Both Adam and Eve was in that body. And God breathed Chaim, life, into them. And then when he parted them, when he opened, took Adam and took half of his body, his, his uh, Basah, and opened that Basah up, and he taken from Ish, as I've told you before, Ish is from, from uh, the compounded words. The rabbis even know this from the word fire and the divine letter Yod in there, which makes God's own name, Hashem, the first letter in his name, and then Eve's name itself. He didn't call her Eve at that time. She wasn't called Chava. She was called Isha. And that again is Alaf Shin He. The He at the end of the word there is you take the, the Yod and the He out of the two parts of their name. You got Yah, which is God's own name itself. And the age represents the fire of the Spirit of God. So when he breathed in Adam's nostrils, he had to breathe in Chaim because there was more than one inside that body. And then he had to separate them. Why? There was a longing for them to want to, to fellowship with one another. God is showing you what... It, you see, the thing is what we don't seem to understand. When God speaks about the tree of life that was in that garden, it's Chaim. All the life, all the spirit of God that ever would have been, that would have gone upon child after child after child that would have been born, that would have given us eternal life to have fellowship with God. God only separated us from himself in order to have fellowship with us. The same as it did Adam and Eve. They wanted to be able to fellowship with one another. So God separated Eve from Adam's body, and now he has two bodies here, so that they can now have fellowship with one with another and they have eternal life. But what's really fascinating though, oh gosh, this gets better and better all the time. Here, let me read to you some more here. Um, in fact, we get, this is where we also, okay, this is, okay. Uh, yeah, it's actually, it's right into the very next verse here. We get into this verse, verse uh, nine. Okay, now he's talking about the tree of life. Betoch Hagan. Hadaat Tov Okay, so God says here. And Hashem God caused to sprout from the ground every tree that was pleasing to the sight and good for food. Also, the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, he doesn't say anything at that point there that the tree of knowledge or the tree of life is pleasant and good for food. He's speaking of the other tree, the trees that they physically eat from. So, if God himself is that tree of life, and I believe the reason why it says in the midst if, if, the, if the heavens and everything in between the water, the life that's on the earth, is a separation between this other water that is somewhere else, and God himself says that he is that water of life, that he is the waters, of the, of the living waters, I think is how the scripture says it, then he, is, he only puts that as a boundary between him and us. But at one time, Adam and Eve had the ability to have fellowship with God directly. And we know that Satan also was in the midst there as well. Because he no doubt must be, if it's metaphorically, he's got to be the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because truly does he not come to Eve and tell her some truth, but he also brings the evil as well to try to cause the fall of mankind. And he's successful in doing so. So... Now, this is one other point I want to really bring to you because we're talking about that water. It says here, and, oh gosh, I, I, I just love this right here. Thank, 
Praise your name, dear God, I love you. Venachar, excuse me, Venachar, which is a river, and uh, it says, Venachar yotze me'edan, and a river came out of, or came out from Eden. La, uh, la shakot, shakot et hagan umasham. Um, so the river comes out from Eden to water the garden. Let me just stop with the garden anyway. Et, haga, et hagan. The, 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 the very word right here, yotze. Venaha yotze me'edan. There is a river coming out of Eden. It comes out of Eden. To, to do what? To water the garden. Now, that may not seem like a, a big deal to you, and I'm going to kind of close it right here with this here. But how does the river come out of Eden if the garden is in Eden? Just an interesting thought. How does that water come out of Eden? To water the garden when the garden is in Eden. I'll just leave you with that to think about it. Very interesting indeed, I'm sure. As you can see, for my Jewish brethren as well, that water that separates, that got separated, God separated using a firmament. And, and we tend to just look at all the universe because it's so vast. We have no way of knowing where the end of it is. And we look at this and we, we kind of limit God. We limit God just thinking the universe is, is the end of it. The universe is, the, is just, it's just a firmament. It's, we can't even explain that word. It's, it's the heavens that are between the waters of life and the waters of natural life on this earth that only sustain the body. On the other side of that firmament is a water flowing of life. So, when this man Jesus died on a cross and this Roman soldier pierced his side in the water that came from him, that water was only a representation that across another dimension there is a water. As I heard a Christian song go like this one time, there is a fountain filled with blood drawing from Emmanuel's veins. There is a water of eternal life. And that water flows from another dimension, but it can wash all of our sins away. He was our sacrifice. He was our lamb. God bless.